Number four in the series on the, the Genesis account as to how everything got here, part four. I was watching CNN, I watch it fairly regularly, it's up to date world news, you're familiar with that broadcasting corporation, the biggest one there is. And the man down here is Varit Zakaria. And he runs the program GPS, which stands for Global Public Square. And I always admire him because he's a good interviewer, he is a good journalist, he has a good grasp on what's going on in the world, he, he, he interviews the world leaders. And then to my surprise, to my surprise, right away from his field, he promotes this book written by Richard Dawkins. Familiar to you? Now, I haven't read the book. It's entitled The Magic of Reality. How do we know what is really true? If you look at the comment here, there posted on the, on the cover, the fourth and fluency of a classic, this book. A luminous, authoritative prose that transcends age differences, which means it's for everyone. I'm surprised, very surprised, that a corporation like CNN gets drawn into it and that this man in particular would see fit to promote this. How powerful it is, how compelling it is out there to accept the evolutionary theology or theory, whatever you like to call it. I'm surprised it was promoted at all and uh, not pleased because here are the topics. What are things made of? I can understand that molecular structure and the atomic integrity of matter. What is the sun? We'll talk a bit about the sun. Why is there night and day? And that's a good question because night and day is extremely important and I'll come back to that. Winter and summer is the one that we're really going to look at. Why do we have a winter and a summer, meaning the seasons, and how necessary they are? Why do bad things happen? Well, we live in a sin that is uh, suffering from the intrusion of sin, and that's what the world uh, situation is, and I'm sure that he has a very different explanation. And are we alone? And that question can be easily answered. No, we're not. Because there is a God. Because if God wasn't there, I hope to convince you as we go through the program, if God wasn't there, you and I wouldn't be here. And of course, there are billions of angels. There are many unfallen worlds, etc. So, these are the issues. Winter and summer. Let's have a look at winter and summer. Which brings us to day four. I want you right now really concentrate, really concentrate on the text that comes from Genesis 1. Before we do that, let's raise this issue. Why do we have winter and summer? And for that matter, how is it that we have those seasons? Why is it like that? And we're going to talk about that. Then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heavens. Now, rakia is really the word down here. Shamayim can be singular or plural. It doesn't matter. In other words, what the Bible is postulating here is that you're on planet Earth and you're in, obviously in the atmospheric uh, uh, region. You can look up and you can see two lights. It's going to talk about two lights. It also mentioned the stars. Come back on that on a minute. What is important is this. Those of you who have attended the previous presentations would remember that the waters were separated from the waters on day two. Remember that? So the water layer above was not a solid fluid condition. It certainly was in water vapor, a dense water vapor, which would allow the visual of the two great lights. Do you understand? Otherwise, the next of the text could not be true. Do you follow me so far? In that sentence, which I'm not dealing with here now, is also the mention that God created the stars also. 
I want you to understand that the uh, semantic structure of the Hebrew sentence here, the grammar is not implying if for one single moment that God created all the stars on day four. That's not implied in the Hebrew. Sometimes with the English translation, it is being taken like that. And if somebody tries to convince you of that, it certainly has to be wrong because the stars were there before the creation of this planet. In fact, Genesis really begins with the presence of what we call the earth. Now, it's crystal clear from other texts in the Bible that whatever is out there, God created it. All matter. God put it together. That is absolutely sure. That is what the Bible indeed teaches. To divide the day from the night, we understand we have the sunlight, of course, during the day, and we have the moon during the night, and you would know, as you're sitting here, where the moon gets its light from. Where does it get its light from? The sun, indeed, indeed. And this is the text that I used to ponder on the great deal. And let them, now them, the antecedent, of course, are the two great lights. They're not mentioned by name, but they're referred to as one for the day, one for the night, and we understand clearly one is the sun and the other one is the moon. Let them be for signs and seasons and for days and years. In other words, that if we were to look up, we would figure out what time frame we at what time part of the time frame we were at it would uh, also of course the seasons tell us uh, pretty well whether it's winter summer and maybe even autumn and spring these are the seasons this is the word that is used and clearly what this text says is this that the two great lights the, those two luminous bodies right there in the sky outside of our spheric condition, that those two great lights will be for signs and the next one I'm interested in is the seasons. Now you have to bear in mind, you have to bear in mind this. This was written how long ago? Three and a half thousand years, half thousand years roughly. I want you to understand that it was written some three and a half thousand years ago. Stay with that text, and now I'm going to show you something. In the left-hand corner, you see a red circle, which, let's say, is the orbit of the moon around the Earth. On the right-hand side, you see the moon, and you can see how much of the moon is lit up. When you look at that yellow, that represents, of course, the sun down here, can you see that at certain positions, we can only see a small portion? It is actually divided in what's called the first quarter, then as the moon gets behind the Earth, the Earth not between the moon and the sun, we have a full moon, third quarter, we go back to the new moon. Can you see what's happening there? Can you follow that? That is how you get your different conditions of the moon and the in-between stages. First quarter, full moon, third quarter, back to the new moon. That's basically a simplification of what's happening. The moon derives its light from the sun. That's what we know for certain. And so, when we look at this other picture here, you can see again <coughs> what you saw basically on the first picture. So here the moon is well lit, for except we're down here and we see the dark side of the moon. Because the same face of the moon the same portion of the moon is facing the earth all the time. Do you understand that? Whereas the earth rotates around its axis once a day, really the rotation of the moon is really once a month, if you like, 28, 29 days. You understand that? You with me here? Okay. So when you look here, we see this side of the moon lit, then we see a full moon, as I said, if there's no obstruction, and normally there isn't, you can see the fully lit portion of the moon, it's fully lit by the sun. And then as you go to the last quarter, it's the other side, the other portion of the moon that is half lit, and you have the in-between stages. You understand? 
Everybody clear on that? Great, okay. There is a tilt of the Earth's spin axis with respect to the plane of its orbit about the Sun. In other words, this line here represents a portion of the whole eclipse of the Earth as it goes around the Sun. It does do so at a speed of about 100,000 kilometers an hour. It's massive. It's massive. In fact, a rotating Earth, we probably at this latitude will be approximately doing about 900 kilometers an hour. You wouldn't feel it, would you? You wouldn't think so. We all look so innocent, but you all ought to be booked for speeding, really. <laughs> that is what's happening here. Now, the interesting thing is that when you look at this orbit here, with the small circle here and the moon there, and it's a bit out of proportion, I realize that, and the distance don't take any notice. But what is interesting, can you see the angle here? See, you can see that there's an, there is a tilt of the axis from pole to pole. Now that's important for the habitable Earth. You need that incline. In fact, when you really look at it, and it's been measured, the Earth's spin axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees. And with respect, of course, of this particular plane. It is not, it is not flush. It has an angle, an angulation of 23 and a half degrees. Is everybody following me here so far? This is very important. This is vitally important you get this. And so, it gives moderate seasons. If you didn't have that, if the Earth was completely flush, the, the axis was completely square on to the sun, you would have no seasons. And seasons are very important for the vegetation of the planet and its survival. If you have extreme seasons, the tilt would be a lot bigger. You would get more pronounced seasons, as I will show you. What would happen is that, again, the vegetation would suffer. And you might argue that if the tilt was too much, we would not have a habitable planet here. It's preventing this angle temperature extremes anywhere on the planet. Marvelous, marvelous design. This is an incredible, accurate design to facilitate the biosphere on this planet. You follow me? Good. There's another little sketch that might be simpler to see. The moon's orbit, the Earth's orbit. It is a magnificent simplicity, but complex to the exquisite, so it works and benefits this planet. Now, another one, just to make sure you get it right. There's the sun in the middle. There is the planet, North and South Pole. In December, there on the Northern <coughs> Hemisphere, you would have the winter, as you know. Of course, we know very well at that time we would have the summer. Now, if you take it half a year further, which is the, the biggest difference, you would have, being halfway through uh, around the sun, you have there your North Pole and your South Pole, but you maintain that same inkling of 23 and a half degrees. What's happening now in June, as the northern part is tilted towards the sun, you get a summer down there, well, not always good ones, but you get a summer down there, and down south, as we well know, we have our winter time. Can you see that? If you look at them, both of them, can you see that this position is absolutely stable? Do you understand? There's two things about a solar system. The soul, with the, the sun, which is considered uh, nominated as an etat, is very stable. It doesn't harm the planet. The planet is well protected, of course, by an electromagnetic spectrum, which I won't talk about today. But what is fascinating is this. This is the argument. If you look at the eclipse of the moon, and you've got to appreciate the attraction between the moon and the sun, uh, and, and the earth. So the earth attracts the moon, 
and the moon is attracted by its gravitational pull to the earth. Its orbit would like to let it go away, but there is a fine balance between its orbit and the gravitational pull, or the tidal force, as we would call it, between the two main objects. Everybody's still with me here. Now you can see that this orbit of the moon holds that particular stability of the 223.5 degrees angle all the time. So we are secured of the seasons. Yeah? Summer, autumn, winter, spring, etc. Very important, very important for flora and fauna on this particular planet. What fascinates me is this. When you look at the simplicity, let's go again here to the, say this was a portion, a certain quantity of sun radiation. Can you see that this portion that is away from the sun, a little bit further away, but also on an incline, is a larger area than the one when the sun is right above you. You know already that if you stand at the equator, the sun should be virtually above you. The higher the sun is, the smaller the area, the smaller the area that receives the same quantity of radiation. So clearly here it is considerably warmer than it would be down there. And you can understand if you turn this one away, like it is on the other side, like down here, you find this area will become larger for the same quantity of radiation. Radiation, when the rays are absorbed, uh, they pass through the atmosphere, they hit the surface of the planet. When the rays are absorbed, the energy comes free as heat. Everybody follow me so far? It, yeah, it's very interesting, isn't it? It's simple and it works. It's been working for thousands of years, not for billions of years. That's what we're going to talk about. Yeah? It is remarkable, once again, that the man Moses wrote down this. He said that both lights, and it's really affirmative in the syntax of the Hebrew, that both lights are needed for the seasons. Did you get that? Not just the one light. You need both lights, both luminous bodies. Yeah? That is a magnificent statement if you consider the fact that that was written three and a half thousand years ago. You will find nothing. You won't find any other source of that era or even thereafter for many, many, many centuries that would state that fact. True? Again, this underwrites, this affirms the inspiration of the Bible. Of course, Moses did not figure this out by himself. Do you understand that? He had no way of... He enjoyed an Egyptian education, with the exception of the, the Hebrew education in the early years, but of course his formal education was Egyptian, and they have a totally different view of what the seasons are all about. Now, I want you to... Have a look at this man. Yeah, he's not as handsome as I am, is he? And Nicholas Copernicus. I couldn't find a better picture, so I put that one up. Now, he was actually a Roman Catholic clergy, but he was a mathematician and an astronomer. And Nicholas Copernicus, he came up with this book. In 1530, he wrote this book, The Revolutionary Bus. And in it, and in it, he postulated that the earth rotated around its axis daily. Because you know what people believed up to that time? The popular, the widespread belief, what people understood, is that we were living in a geocentric universe. They believed that the earth, that the earth was the center of the universe. And the sun also, like the moon, would go around the earth. Do you understand? That is what was... You're talking 16th century. Up to the 16th century, that is what was believed. It is amazing 
that the man Moses never made that error. In fact, the way he describes the necessity of the two lights for the seasons would intimate that it could only be a reality if the earth would rotate around its axis. Because if the sun goes around the earth once a day, you have four seasons in a day. You with me? I find that fantastic. You can trust your Bible. And so he asserted that the earth rotated on its axis once daily. He was declared by most people as to be completely deluded, but he wasn't. He wasn't. When he observed, this is without a telescope, when he observed there in Fraunhaus, he there in the cathedral, he was looking at the stars and the positioning in relation to the earth, and particularly the moon, and he could see, he could see that the way that the moon was lit, he could tell there is no way that that sun could go around the earth, because the moon too would have procession, first quarter, full moon, third quarter, and a new moon. You understand that? You wonder why they didn't pick that up earlier. But without the telescope, the telescope had, and you don't need a telescope for that, and, and, and he didn't have one because the telescope was not invented yet. That came uh, decades later. A man by the name of Christian Huygens, he, uh, he invented the telescope. Touchman, uh, of course. And um, so that was, and traveled around the sun once yearly. Traveled around the sun once yearly. This is fantastic. This was very revolutionary. In fact, the man compared the Galilee Galileo picked up on that. And that's again a little sketch of the reality. Galilee Galileo supported that notion of what is called now a heliocentric universe at that time. So what he postulated, the same as Copernicus, that the sun was the center of the universe and all the planets would go around the sun. That is what was accepted by him. He got into hot water with the, uh, with the Roman Catholic Church. That was not just for this. He insulted a bit the current pope. He became for the Inquisition. And normally when you come to the Inquisition, it's a one-way street. You understand? You disappear. But they, uh, out of the respect of the, the, the dignity of the man, uh, they, they gave him house arrest uh, till, the, till he died in the city of Florence. So he survived that, but only barely. But that's the situation. Now let's have a look at the moon. It's interesting. There is the moon. And it is the Earth's only natural satellite. We only have one, as you know. It is one, in fact, of the largest natural satellites in the solar system. It's quite large. And among the planetary satellites, actually, it is the largest in relation to the planet that it orbits. The moon, the circumference, the, di the, the sorry, diameter is about one-sixth of the planet, our planet, and one eightieth of the mass of this planet. Still a significant satellite, if you like. Now what is interesting is that the distance to the Earth is how much? Anybody? Any takers? Any takers? One uh, give me kilometers, my son. Not bad, he's getting close, he's getting close. 384. I should have put money on it. 384,000. <laughs> That's not bad. 384,400 kilometers or most of the time. So there's a bit of a variance. The moon is actually the second densest moon in the solar system. That's quite interesting. There's only one moon by the name of Io. That's one of the moons of Jupiter that is more dense. It's interesting when you look at it. The density of the moon is just that. If you took and you weighed it here, you took up some of that quantity of soil, a, 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 a cubic centimeter, its weight would be 3.346 gram. The planet Earth is denser, 5.52 gram. Any argument that the moon might have come from this planet is 
fraught with difficulties, and one of the things is the difference in density, also the difference, by the way, when they brought back the moon rocks, as they did, and promptly dated them at 4.5 billion years. like to see how they did that, but that's what they did. The interesting thing is that, the interesting thing is that there's a slight or not a reasonably significant difference in, in chemical composition of the moon rocks in relation to this planet. So that's another uh, battle you have to fight if you want to argue that the moon came from actually this planet. We're going to look at that in a minute. The distance between the Earth and the moon increases approximately four centimeters a year. Did you know that? Widely accepted also in evolutionary circles. It's a fact, it's measurable. So if it's observable, but observable by trained, by trained uh, eyes, by trained methodology, you would have to accept it. If you go back a thousand years, uh, no, if you go back six thousand years, you would talk about a difference of about 800 feet. The, sun, the, the moon is 800 feet further from this planet. Now it's interesting if you do a back pedal. If you take this figure, and there is a consensus on this figure, and you do a back pedal, and you say, well, how can we calculate how long it took the moon to get to where it was? Do you know if that's what you follow, and evolutionary thinking, the law of uniformitarianism, you come to a figure of 1.4 billion years. Now I tell you why that is significant. They they said that the moon was 4.5 billion years old, like the Earth. That's interesting. If that were true, 4.5 billion years, how do you explain the 1.4 billion years? And I could argue that in the beginning it would have had to have been faster for a variety of reasons. 1.4 billion years defeats the theory of evolution as it is generally believed. It is not sufficient to have to derive at the flora and fauna that we have today within that time frame. It would be a brave evolutionist to argue that we could in that time frame or less. So that would be impossible. The moon would be touching the earth. It would be. And now you've got to start explaining that, how it came loose if it touched the Earth, or was part of the Earth. At the present rate of separation, if we are 4.5 billion years old, the Moon would be completely out of sight by now. It would have to be. You couldn't look at the Moon. Do you understand what I just said? If that's the age of the Moon, that's the age of this planet, how do you explain that? Of course, the, the, the question that arises is really this. What if there was no moon? Could we live without the moon? Well, with great difficulty. The sun is actually 400 times larger in diameter than the moon. It's also interesting that on average it's about 400 times further away. That when you see a solar eclipse, as we rarely do, but sometimes... You can see the sun being covered, and it's a magnificent sight and occasion when, you, when it happens in your, in your area. There's only certain parts of the world that you can see that from. It's quite interesting. To me, that already looks like design. Our tides, the tide, you know, the, the water, you, un you understand the tides on this planet. You know, you go to the beach, I go to the beach every day, I run five kilometers. Stop lying. <laughs> yeah. And so, when I walk, there is high tide and there is low tide. Are you with me? And of course, that has everything to do with the two major bodies up there. It has to do with the sun and it has to do with the moon. But the moon is the primary initiator of those tides. And those tides are very important for our ecology because they clean the river system. They all the beaches. It's not too much. It doesn't erode. Uh, no erosion of any significance unless we have extreme weather conditions. But you need that movement so the water is not stagnant and it really promotes the usefulness 
of the water resources that we have on this planet. You all know that stagnant water is not good. And so we need, we need those tides. If we didn't have the moon, we would only be relying on the tides of the sun as we rotate. And the sun, though it's a much bigger body with a much more superior gravitational pull, is so far away, however, it could only produce 40% of the tidal that we have. Do you understand? So it would be a detriment. It would not be good for our environment. The nights would be much darker because you would miss that light source. The nights would be darker and our axle tilt, I just showed you that the orbit of the moon around the earth is so essential for the stability of the 20s preservation of the 23 and a half degree tilt, which as it moves around the sun yearly gives us the seasons. Do you understand? You may well find that the axle tilt would actually vary tremendously over time because there's nothing to hold it in place. Which means that we could either go towards very extreme seasons or we go to an absolute absence of seasons. You wish me? Does everybody grasp that? I like this sort of thing. I, I like sitting down. If I had more time, I'd keep you here all afternoon. No, it's fascinating. Particularly in the light of the statement that those two great lights, both of them are needed for the seasons as we know it. Because that was there right at the very beginning. When God could say on day six, and God saw that it was good, and God said that it was what? Very good. So there you are, God designed it. The Earth's rotation is being slowed down tidal, through the tidal interactions with the Moon. Do you know that the rotation of the Earth, generally agreed on, is slowing down? It is two thousandths of a second per century. You wouldn't notice it really. Get it? But it actually is it's quite interesting. If the moon had never existed, the earth would be spinning faster. You go back to billions of years, the earth would have had to have been spinning a lot, a lot, a lot faster. In fact, if it did, our day would probably be about six to eight hours. That's a computation, it's a projection. We've never seen it, but that's what is considered. And academics, they, they accept that. It would be much shorter. The fast rotation rate would lead to faster winds and stronger storms because quicker heating, quicker cooling off, and that of course causes the storms. This planet will be very hard to live on, very hard indeed. The fast rotation speed would also have implication for plant photosynthesis, which of course takes the carbon dioxide and it puts the oxygen in the air. You with me? Shorter time frames. Uh, and animal hunting and sleeping cycles, they also would have to get used to it. And that's a great adjustment that much of the, of the animal kingdom perhaps could not adjust to. Have a look at this. There is the Earth. It has a gravity towards the Moon. The Moon has a gravity towards the planet. And so, if you look at the force of the mutual attraction between the two, it is so enormous if you took a steel cable, if you took a steel cable and it was in the, in the understanding that there would be no gravity, so you have a moon going at its orbital speed, which is quite fast, and you want the hole to keep the two together, and you did so by a, by a steel cable, how big do you think the steel cable would have to be? Any guesses? That's not a fair question, but uh, really? yeah, I like that. <laughs> He's right, he had it in one. No, no, don't do, overdo it, son, don't overdo it. 850 kilometers wide, you understand? Now that's massive. It would have to be 850 kilometers in diameter to provide an equivalent binding force without breaking. Anything less, it would break, and the moon would escape, catapulted back into whatever. You with me? It's interesting. It's fascinating. Uh, that fascinates me. 
Here you have the moon, you can see the high tides. So here it's the gravitational pull, there it's much less, so the water goes there and you have a high tide there, but the higher one is here. And of course, if you have the moon and the sun lined up, you have a spring tide. Now, the moon's size and closeness to Earth means it has the greatest tidal effect on the Earth because it's much closer than the sun. But if you didn't have the moon, you only have 40%, roughly. Even the sun has less than half its effect, in fact 40%, and the effect of, our, of other planets is absolutely negligible. In the, the other planets in the solar system virtually have no effect on this. Now here's an interesting thing. Have you ever heard of the Rose Limit? Can I see your hands? How many of you have heard of this? Nobody? Oh, I can tell you anything then. Yeah. <laughs> the Rose Limit is a barrier, um, a fictitious barrier, of some 18,400 kilometers. They're quite specific about it. From planet Earth. The yellow one here is planet Earth, if you can remember that. It's not the Sun, it's the Earth. Here we have the Moon. Now, where the Moon is right now, it's perfect. The tidal force is a secondary effect of the force of the gravity. In other words, I hope you follow me, please, please do. Here you have a gravitational capacity that extends all the way there. How strong, and we just said, you know, what it needs, the steel cable, but how strong could it be without damaging the integrity of that planet? So it's not just the pull of the moon towards the Earth, it is the Earth towards the moon, which is the secondary effect. From Earth to Moon is the secondary effect that we are looking at. And that is by far the greater force between the two. Now, <clears throat> let me show you something. Far from the Rose limit, the mass is practically spherical. Yeah, it's virtually round. That's good. Now, if we brought it closer to the Ross limit, you can see the shape would be changing because of the gravitational pull from this planet, the secondary effect of the mass of, the, of planet Earth would distort the integrity of the moon. In fact, let's take it one step further. If it were to hit the Rose limit itself, this is interesting, you would find this, that within the Rose limit, the mass own gravity, which preserves its integrity, can no longer withstand the tidal force, the pulling force, the gravitational force. In fact, this portion here that is the closest will simply disintegrate. Now, remember that the moon is orbiting this planet. It's orbiting this planet. One step further, this is what you would get. The red one, closer, first to disintegrate, would move faster than the blue one, which disintegrates somewhat later, and what you will end up with is ultimately <coughs> this. The varying orbital speed from red to, to blue of the material <coughs> eventually causes it to form a ring. We will be like Saturn, plenty of rings around Saturn, you understand? Now that's very important. All the philosophies, all the thinking, all the arguments that the moon somehow got this lot from this planet. Now it is rubbish. George Darwin, the brother of Charles Darwin, suggested the fission theory which says that the earth at one stage was spinning so fast, it was spinning so fast that the dust escaped the gravitational pull of this planet I pull my leg, I mean you can't, that's in, you know, unimaginable. And that somehow out there, all the dust got together, imploded and became the moon. Nobody believes that. But he's a bit like his brother. He came up with something that really could not be supported. Um, there are other of course as well, let's go back, there is another one, another theory that says that an object hit this planet Earth in such a way that the moon was enough matter was dislodged from this planet and that then became the moon. For that to happen you would have to have an object that is twice the size 
as planet Mars. And you would agree with me, that sort of impact would have to be, would have to be very visible, very visible in its effect it would have on this planet. There's no such thing. Then there is another, then there is another belief that somehow the moon wandered into our solar system very close to planet Earth and, and, and the, the gravity of the Earth caught it and, and, and it just started to orbit. That's ridiculous. I don't know whether they really believe it. It couldn't be true. The unlikely, the unlikeliness of that is just so incredible. Mathematically, it just couldn't be done and you would get an elongated uh, orbit of the moon very much like a comet. You never get the near circular orbit that we have enjoying for the moment with the, uh, the moon to the earth. Impossible. Anyway, here is thinking. Distance, 100, almost 150 million kilometers away from us. That's a long way, the sun. Its diameter is about 109 times that of planet Earth, and it has a mass of about 330,000 times this planet. It's massive. It is, it is, a, it is a massive, massive entity but by no means compared to the other stars in the universe, terribly large at all. Accounting, as far as our solar system is concerned, it accounts for 99.86% of the mass, the total mass, that is us and all the other planets plus orbiting moons. It represents 99.86% of the total mass of our solar system. And that gives you an idea how huge it is. How huge it is. As to the sun, how long has it been there? Uh, is it losing mass? After all, it expels this tremendous energy, and energy is mass. Einstein taught us that. Lots of arguments, which we won't go into, and I certainly won't deal with it, but it is interesting that certainly our understandings or belief systems that say that the, that the sun is actually losing mass. In other words, that the fusions there of, of, of the hydrogen, basically, in the helium, could only last, and that's an approximation, that's an estimate, even amongst evolutionary circles, of some 10 billion years. I'll come to that. Our sun is also the right mass. In other words, if it was too big, it would be no good. If it was larger, that would be too much high energy radiation. Now, the planet is protected by an electromagnetic spectrum, and I'm, I'm not dealing with that today. Uh, we can't do everything, uh, and I don't want the fear of throwing too much information. Uh, we keep it simple, but basically that protects us from the radiation as it comes from the sun, which if we were unprotected, it's interesting, we would have no biological life on this planet. It's interesting. It was larger, then there would be too much high energy radiation. If it was smaller, the range of the planetary distance, that means from the planet to the sun, able, our planet, able to support life, would be far too far if it was far too small. And we wouldn't have life here. We just wouldn't have it. The Earth's distance from the sun is crucial for a stable water cycle, because if it's too close, the water will boil, and if it's too far, the water will freeze. What I'm trying to bring home to you here is just a few bits and pieces of information. I want you to understand that if you look at the balance of the structure, the balance of the correlation in our solar system is so finely tuned. Do you understand? Now if you say this happened just by coincidence, come on. Come on, it can't be true. It has to be designed. Since the sun is powerful by fusion of hydrogen, it could burn for about 10 billion years. That's a consensus, sort of. Having now half the time, four point, well, almost half, 4.5 billion years later, we're halfway. What are we going to do for a sun in another 5 billion years? 5.5 billion years. I wouldn't worry about it. About half the time have passed already. But there is, there is a consequence in that belief. 
as the composition of the core changes, and that is a fact of the sun, as it changes, because it has to give up of its core for energy purposes, then you'll find that the light would become more intense. That's agreed upon, both sides. If it would have been, if it would have been around for four and a half billion years, that means that the light would have been far less dense in proportion than what it is today, as it has been losing of its core 4.5 billion years, that would have an implication, and a tremendous implication is this. The sun should be about 40% brighter today than it was 4.5 billion years ago. This would have impacted the temperature of the other planets, and evolutionists must explain how life evolved on a planet that would likely to have been frozen for at least the first two to three billion years. And that gives you evolutionary cycle, you shorten that enormously, and how do you get, as I said, to the flora and fauna that we have today? Evolutionists admit themselves, you need that time frame. And so that's now drastically reduced. I'm just saying, what I'm saying is this, that if you walk away from the Bible, if you walk away from the Bible, you have to start explaining how you do that. In a discussion with the atheist, the man said, he said, you're a Christian, it's up to you to prove there's God. I said, well, there is, and I'll prove it. But you know, I'm a gentleman, I'll let you go first. You prove that there is no God. And then explain to me everything how we got here. Anyway, a long conversation. But the Earth's gravity, the Earth's gravity is just perfect. If it would have been too much, it would be detrimental for our physics, for our physical condition. Uh, the actual tilt, it has to be just right, 23 and a half degrees. It's just right. The rotation period, if the rotation of this planet was very slow, then that which was exposed for much longer than a day, let's say days or years, that would be exposed to this and everything would burn up. And the other side, away from the sun, would be absolutely frozen cold. You couldn't have... You couldn't have biological life on this planet. If that was true, the rotation was too long. The magnetic field, and as I said, I'm not going to deal with the magnetic field, but let me tell you, if you study the magnetic field, you will know it can only have been around for a certain amount of time. You, at most, are talking about 20,000 years. Because it decays every 1,400 years by about half. It's interesting. The crust thickness of the planet is essential, that it is the right thickness. I know we have impairments because we have tectonic plates and all the other things. And if you study the, the story of the flood in the Bible, you get all the answers in that respect as well, how that happened. Because God created a perfect world with a perfectly stable Earth's crust. The oxygen-nitrogen ratio is fantastic. Oxygen level, 21 degrees. Uh, the, the nitrogen, 78, sorry... Uh, Percentage. Nitrogen, about 78%, and then there's a makeup of just over 1% of other gases. If we had more, if we had more oxygen on this planet, the ignition danger, that spontaneous ignition of whatever is combustible, would be so great we would have spontaneous fires all over the place. We would. If we had less oxygen, we would have a problem to survive as the way we are. We just couldn't do that. It's a fine balance. The carbon dioxide level, four parts per million, whatever that is. But it's, we just have the right balance of carbon dioxide. You need carbon dioxide in the atmosphere because, because the vegetation, all the greens, the chlorophyll, they take the carbon dioxide out of the air. Do you understand? They need that and then they give us back the oxygen and they keep the carbon which is part of the building block regime for any, any plant. Water vapor density, you need water vapor. You need that, it's the major co to contributor to a greenhouse condition. You need a greenhouse condition, you need a climate that is warm enough, not too warm and not too cold. We have that because of the water vapor density, only half a percent. With ozone levels, 
our ozone levels are just right. You know, the ozone layer, which gets damaged because some of the chemicals that we uh, let free in the, in, in the atmosphere. You know, it's interesting. If you put all the ozone together, it'll be as thick as just a plane of glass. But without it, we couldn't live. Because it filters the, that radical portion of the ultraviolet of the sun and it protects us by and large. If it thins, we are exposed to changes of our DNA. You know about the skin cancer and the carcinoma that comes from that. So you need an ozone. But ozone, if you have too much, particularly, particularly now, if you have too much, you get the downdrafts, you get the ozone in the atmosphere, it's detrimental and it shortens your life. Can you see that everything in this planet, on this planet, is finely balanced? I put it to you, it is designed. It couldn't be anything else. So clearly. Sir Frederick Holes, a fellow of the Royal Society, he was, uh, he, he doesn't believe, he's an atheist, well, I don't know if he still is, but he was then. Um, he, um, he doesn't believe in the Big Bang Theory, so he fell out of flavor with all of his colleagues. But he said this, in a moment of honesty, common sense interpretation of the facts is, have a look how he puts it. That a super intelligence has monkeyed with the physics. Now well, he uses that expression. What does he mean? He said there is an intelligence out there that has manipulated the physics. And not only the physics, the chemistry and the biology. A fine scholar, the theory of the stellar uh, nuclear synthesis, it was his specialization. If you want to know what it is, I'll tell you afterwards. It's interesting. He came to the realization that what you see, that what you find, a super intelligence has manipulated it. So it's working, you understand. And so, there are no blind forces in nature. I like that. I like that. He was honest about it. I can't resist this one. I can't resist it. Job, can you bind the cluster? I was talking about that in the other place this morning. Can you bind, can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades? Now, you know what the Pleiades is. Do you know what that is? It's a cluster of stars, most of them it's big, bigger than our sun. You can see with the naked eye about 8, 9, depends. There's about 16 to 17 if you have a good telescope. It is part of the constellation of Taurus. There's something very unique about this cluster. It, by the way, who wrote the book of Job? Moses. Moses. So that's three and a half thousand years old. And Job lived well before Moses, most likely before Abram. Can you bind the cluster of the Pleiades or lose the belt of Orion? Now, the cluster of the Pleiades is unique in that it travels through space and it adheres to an integrity in relation to one and another. They are not separating. They maintaining the same distance. We can measure that now. We can measure that. But you couldn't then when it was written. Lose the belt of Orion. Let me help you here. Let me help you here. Do you see ever in the sky that upside down saucepan? Yeah? That is part of the constellation of Orion. Here is Orion. You see, what is a constellation? A constellation is really a collection of lights there that you can see virtually with the naked eye and you make a story about it. So, here we have Orion the hunter with a club and he's giving that lion what for? Now I want you to see this one. One, the Mintaka, the Alinam, the Ali that's what they're called. Right here, that's the belt of Orion. Can you see that? Those three little dots here come there. His left kneecap is there. The right kneecap is there. The armpit is down there. I hope he uses deodorant. And there is the left shoulder. <laughs> Do you understand? Can you see the story in the skies? 
loose the belt, apparently that belt is expanding. Like someone who puts on weight. <laughs> you understand? It's interesting. Let, let, let me show you. The belt across the middle of Orion, from west to east, the Bintaka, Al Nilam, and Al Nitak. So apparently close together, you can live hundreds of years, a thousand years. You could not tell the difference from clear their observation. The apparently close together, these stars are not members of a cluster like the Pleiades. They are traveling in different directions at an enormous velocity. That's interesting. Question. How did Moses know that the belt of Orion is being loosed? Huh? And that the cluster of the Pleiades holds its integrity. Johann Heinrich von Maitler, he was the director of the Berlin Observatorium. He uh, he was a member of about 19 societies. He was a man of distinction. He was not always right about astrology, but astronomy, I'm sorry, but he was very good. He wrote a paper in 1846, in 1846, the middle almost of the 19th century. He discovered that the stars of the Pleiades had no measurable proper motion relative to each other. We already said that. Because by this time, and it's been confirmed many times later, by this time it was measurable. The instrumentaria was there, the methodology was there. The common proper motion of the Pleiades was proof that they move as a group through space. Exactly as the Bible writer wrote three and a half thousand years ago. You will find no other document preceding that of 1846 by Johann Heinrich von Maitler on the face of this planet to make that same suggestion. You know, there is a time, there is a time when you got to concede that the Bible is the word of God. They form a physical cluster. That's the reality. When we choose to believe on him, he will tax the remotest star and the last grain of salt to assist us with his almighty power because the God of the universe is the creator and he can help you whatever your problem is. If he can do that, he can do that. Absolutely. Never tolerate, and here's an inducement, because of sympathy for yourself or for others, any practice that is not in keeping with the will of a holy God. And that goes for all of us, guys. Because he is the creator. And we're here because he made us. And so, don't blame sin on your fallen nature or on a fallen world. Settle for nothing less than God's best for you. I like this guy. I don't know whether I've told this story. I put it together and then I thought, I wonder if I told them. But I, I thought to myself, I'll leave it there because they probably won't remember. <laughs> uh, you may. Professor Richard Lumsden was irate because the, the state of, of Louisiana made a law that evolution could be taught in, in pre-college schools, but also creation should be taught. And he thought, that's rubbish. He was an evolutionist, he was an atheist. And he decided on the university where he taught, he was a professor in parasitology and also cell biology. He was a very eminent scientist. Still is. No, he's dead, of course, 1997, he passed away. At the Tulan University in, in Louisiana, he gave an address to a body of students and he was so effective, he was so effective in that address uh, he, he virtually had reduced his audience to a silence. And he received a tremendous applause. He rubbished the Bible. He rubbished the creationist. He ridiculed the idea of a God that would create all of the above. And as he was packing his stuff, one of his best students, young lady, came to him and she said, Professor, could I make an appointment with you 
I'd like to talk to you about some of the, the aspects. That was great, by the way. I, I enjoyed that. But I want to clear up some... Could you help me with that? He said, sure, dear. Sure. And he made an appointment. She said, I only need about 20 minutes. All right. So she came next day, the afternoon. It wasn't 20 minutes. It was three and a half hours. And she said, Professor, <coughs> thank you for your lecture. It was so informative. That primordial soup that you were talking about, and you were talking about the chemical compounds and, and that they turned into, uh, into uh, amino acids. How did, that, how did that happen? He didn't know. He said, well, that's for two, which is random movements, and there was an energy that was supplied, and the usual... And they said, okay, okay. Now, now, now about those amino acids. So, so they form proteins, don't they? Yes, yes. And then, then it, and how did it come into a cell, a cellular biological structure, with a membrane that's permeable of everything that needs to be chucked out of the cell and attracts all the energy from outside, just sufficient so it keeps on going and it can, you know, it can duplicate, etc., etc. Well, and he gave explanations, and as he was talking, and the questions kept pounding and pounding and pounding. She never argued with him, she never said he was wrong, she just asked the question. She majored in math, and she had some information for him as to the probability of what he was telling. And as he was explaining it to her, as he had done hundreds of times, as he was explaining it to her, do you know he was starting to disbelieve his belief? Ever explain something and you think to yourself, hang on, that's not correct. But what can I do? I tell him anyway. I don't do that, by the way. Just in case. He was, at the end of the three and a half hours, he was washed out. And he sat down there and he thought to himself, what's happening here? I never quite looked at it that way. And he decided he was going to check everything. He decided he would get into the lab, whatever the tests were. He decided he was going to prove on, in an observable way, in, in a repeatable way, that what he said was, and he tried everything and everything went wrong and nothing worked. And he came to the conclusion there has to be a designer. Someone put it together. He was at home having his usual bottle of whatever it was. He liked his little spirit. He liked to be spirit filled but in a different way what we're pursuing here. And he got a phone call from his ex-wife. And you can immediately tell, he could tell that it was her, Richard. And that's only one person who could say it like that. And it would normally mean money. But it wasn't this time. She said, she said we have a problem. And he thought, well, I thought we solved it. We got divorced. <laughs> we have a problem. Your daughter, he said, you mean our daughter. Yeah, 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 yeah that one. You're 17 years old. Your daughter has become a Christian. Richard! In other words, what are you going to do about it? She said, it's terrible. He said, it'll go away. He said, no. She goes to, this is Sunday keeping this, she goes to church twice on a Sunday. And not only that, she goes on a Tuesday. And then she has a prayer meeting on a Thursday. This is crazy. You need to talk to her. Yeah, I will. It's a fad. It'll go away. Then he gets a phone call from his daughter. And she said, Dad, I know you like classical music. There is an orchestra coming, small orchestra uh, of people and some singers. And, and you would enjoy that. Can I please invite you to come? And he said, sure, honey. I'll, I'll, I'll come with you. She said, it's at church. He said, what? <laughs> Did you say at church? Yes, Dad, at church. Please, 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 please. You know, daughters have a way of asking. You may as well pay right away up front because that's... Anyway. 
So he went. And he, Professor Richard Lumsden, knowing there'd be people who would know him, risked his reputation as an atheist, as an evolutionist. He risked his reputation and he went to church with his daughter. Full church. Music was good. He just sat there. Music was nice. And then this preacher got up. And this preacher preached actually on the third chapter of the Gospel of John. He preached on being born again. A new mind. A new way. A new reality. And he couldn't help it. He was listening. And, and funny enough, to this know-it-all scientist, what that man said made absolute sense. But he didn't want to show it that he enjoyed. That he was fascinated by what that preacher had to say. And so the preacher, an evangelist, invited everybody to stand. And as he invited everybody to stand, he, he said, I want, you to bow your eye. I want you to bow your head. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to close your eyes, all of you. And if anybody amongst you would like to come forward here to the altar, please come. Please come. I want to pray with you. I want to pray for you. Please come. Richard... Uh, Lamson stood there, eyes closed, and uh, the preacher went on and on and on, and he couldn't wait until it was finished. He wanted to get out of there. And then somebody pushed him in the, like that. And he thought, oh, that's my daughter, she's had enough. So he took a step, two steps, and then he was in the middle of the aisle. He didn't realize that. And then somebody pushed him in the back. And he was going to turn around and tell his daughter, knock it off. But she was over there. She was nowhere near him. He observed her. She was on her knees. She was on her knees, not standing, on her knees, praying. Richard Lumsden had never seen anybody pray like that. The, 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 the hands were clasped with enormous force. The tears were coming out of her eyes. The intensity of the prayer of his girl. And he couldn't help but think, that kid is praying for me. And she was. He stood there. And then he looked up and he saw the preacher. And the preacher's eyes locked on to Richard and wouldn't let go. And he invited him to come forward. In the own words of this professor, with flesh protesting every inch of the way, I found myself walking forward down to the altar and there found God. Truly at that moment, I came to know him. He says, and I received the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord of Savior. Great story. Sometimes you got to stop being clever. Take the word of God for what it is. It's the truth. Years later, after Christian life and affiliation with a Baptist church I think it was he went to a it was a um, scientific do and he said so it and then as it was finished he got up and at the same time two people her and him her was that student that had visited him and had a three and a half hour interview and she looked at him, and she looked at him, and she came to him, and she said, it happened to you, didn't it? He said, yes, yes, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. He said, I am. She said, you know, Professor Richard, throughout all my university years, I have prayed for every lecturer 
But for you, I prayed the most. And he couldn't, he hugged there and he said, I want to thank you. The power of the word and the power of prayer, you'll make it to the other side. We have a special item. Happy Sabbath. Do you believe there is strength in the name of the Lord? There is power in the name of the Lord? There is hope? As I sing this song, probably you, you heard this song so many times, but I want you to meditate the lyrics. Not because of my voice, but it's for the Lord.
unfortunately, Marcia, where are you? What did you get to disappear to? Right. Blimey, I always look further, don't I? So this is your last status for a little while until you come back permanently in Sydney. Don't laugh, just say yes. Okay, we would, uh, we would say that we have really enjoyed your ministry here and we really look forward to see you again very soon. I just want to ask Elaine and Joe to come here. Sorry, Kevin, can you come as well? Okay, and Christiana, could you come as well? Where's Christiana going to? That's it. Your idea, now you come to the front down there. These two, you have a good look at them. Because you see a single man and you see a single woman. But the next time you look at them, it's no longer true. Because tomorrow, you haven't got cold feet, have you? <laughs> because tomorrow, it'll be completely different. They're getting married. Isn't that wonderful? So happy for the both of you, and I thought we might like to have a special prayer. And uh, I asked Kevin to give us a little prayer. Yes. Our Father in heaven, we uh, certainly are so happy to. Uh There is no greater reward for anybody in ministry than when someone says, I do want to make that step. And I pray that it is in your heart and in your mind that you do that. Shall we bow our head once again? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can know for absolute certain that whatever there is, including us, came from your loving hands. Sin is an intruder, there's cruelty and suffering. But Lord, we accept your promise that everything will be restored into that perfect state when you truly can say again, and everything is very good. Lord, give us the courage to make that step, to make that commitment 
to be with you forever. To confess, to believe that you are God and there are no other gods before you. We thank you for Jesus, for all the power that he will give us through the agency of the Holy Spirit that we can be enabled to live that life that you want us to live we need you we need the Spirit hold on to us forgive us if we have been slow but hold on to us bring us home soon so Lord as we depart from here as we will partake of the refreshment, may you bless the refreshment, bless the willingness of those who contribute and prepare. Bless the fellowship, Lord, as we are after all, all journeying the same direction towards the gates of that heavenly Jerusalem. We want to see it and physically walk through it. Keep us near to you. In Jesus' most precious name. Amen. God bless you.